Good morning, Bradley Elementary. It's 1031. Sorry, we are a little late um, because the internet has been um, kind of monkey here at Bradley. In fact, it just froze on me. So let's see if it catches back up. Oh, there we go. So let's see what's happening here. We are having internet problems. So hopefully this will continue. If for some reason uh, it goes, there, come on, there we go. If for some reason it goes dud on us, we will uh, try it again in a different format. So um, Mr. Saxon reads at 1030 and lots going on here, I guess. So we got two books to read this morning, and then this afternoon's read is going to be at 2.30 today, so 2.30 this afternoon. I've got a meeting at 1.30, uh, so we had to push it back a little bit. So away we go. We're going to start with Chester's Way, all right? Once again, we're repping the Steelers. We're also repping uh, Cat and Cloud, all right? So uh, that's local business there. Um they are doing takeout service for coffee. And I think Coralito's Coffee House is starting a takeout service too. Uh, so support your local businesses during this crazy time if you're out and about. Remember, stay six feet apart though. Social distancing is important. Um, so away we go. Chester's way. Chester had his own way of doing things. Hello, my name is Chester. I like croquet and peanut butter and making my bed. Chester. Chester is a little mouse. He always cut his sandwiches diagonally. He always got out of bed on the same side, and he never left the house without double knotting his shoes. Chester always had the same thing for breakfast, toast with jam and peanut butter. And he always carried a miniature first aid kit in his back pocket, just in case. You definitely have a mind of your own, said Chester's mother. That's one way to put it, said Chester's father. You can see Chester doing all those different things. Chester's best friend, Wilson, was exactly the same way, and that's why they were best friends. Chester wouldn't play baseball unless Wilson played, and they never swung at the first pitch or slid head first. Wilson wouldn't ride his bike unless Chester wanted to, and they always used hand signals. If Chester was hungry, Wilson was too, but they rarely ate between meals. And some days, I can't tell those two apart, said Wilson's mother. Me either, said Wilson's father. Chester and Wilson, Wilson and Chester. And that's the way it was. They loved to go on picnics. And once when Wilson accidentally swallowed a watermelon seed and cried because he was afraid that a watermelon plant would grow inside him, Chester swallowed one, too. Don't worry, said Chester. Now if you grow a watermelon plant, I'll grow one, too. Chester duplicated his Christmas list every year and gave a copy to Wilson because they always wanted the same things anyway. If you swallow a watermelon seed, you don't really grow a watermelon plant. For Halloween, they always dressed as things that went together. Salt and pepper shakers, two mittens on a string, ham and eggs. They really are two peas in a pod, said Chester's mother. Looks like it, said Chester's father. You can see them dressed up there. In spring, Chester and Wilson shared the same umbrella. And in winter, they never threw snowballs at each other. In fall, they raked leaves together. And in summer, they reminded each other to wear sunscreen so they wouldn't burn. Look at them doing all those things together. They are best buddies. Chester and Wilson, Wilson and Chester, that's the way it was. And then Lily moved into the neighborhood. Lily had her own way of doing things. I'm Lily, I am the queen, and I like everything. Uh-oh, I wonder what's going to happen here. She wore band-aids all over her arms and legs to look brave, and she talked backwards to herself sometimes so no one would know what she was saying, and she never left the house 
without one of her nifty disguises. I don't know how you talk backwards. That would be hard to do. Lily waved at all the cars that passed by, even if she didn't know who was in them. And she always carried a loaded squirt gun in her back pocket, just in case. She definitely has a mind of her own, said Chester. That's one way to put it, said Wilson. When Lily asked Chester and Wilson to play, they said they were too busy. When she called them up on the phone, they disguised their voices and said they weren't home. If Lily was walking on one side of the street, Chester and Wilson crossed to the other and hid. She's something else, said Chester. Looks like it, said Wilson. I do not think those two boys are being very nice to Lily. What do you think? Do you think they're being nice? I think they could be nicer. One day, while Chester and Wilson were practicing their hand signals, some older boys rode by, popping wheelies. They circled Chester and Wilson and yelled personal remarks. Uh-oh, looks like Chester and Wilson are being bothered. Chester and Wilson didn't know what to do, and just when they were about to give up, Hope, a fierce-looking cat with horrible fangs, jumped out of the bushes and frightened the older boys away. Who do you think that is? I know. Do you know? Are you who I think you are, Chester asked the cat. Of course, the cat replied. Thank you, Lily, said Chester. You're welcome, Chester, said Lily. Thank you, Lily, said Wilson. You're welcome, Wilson, said Lily. I'm glad you were wearing a disguise, said Chester. And I'm glad that you had your squirt gun, said Wilson. I always do, said Lily, just in case. Lily was nice to those boys no matter what had happened. Afterward, Chester invited Lily over for lunch. You have a muscle mouse cup, said Lily. Of course, said Chester. I do too, said Lily. Same here, said Wilson. Chester and Wilson cut their sandwiches diagonally. Lily asked Chester's mother if she had a cookie cutter and she made stars and flowers and bells. That's neat, said Chester. Wow, said Wilson. I think Chester and Wilson are learning some new things. That night, Lily invited Chester and Wilson to sleep over. You have a nightlight, said Chester. Of course, said Lily. I do too, said Chester. Same here, said Wilson. Chester and Wilson wanted toast with jam and peanut butter for breakfast the next morning. Boring, said Lily. Try this instead. This is good, said Chester. Wow, said Wilson. I think she's got like some French toast there with a smiley face. After that, when Lily asked Chester and Wilson to play, they said yes. And when she called them up on the phone, they had pleasant conversation. And if Lily was walking on one side of the street, Chester and Wilson waved and ran to catch up with her. Check it out. She's got her disguise on. Chester and Wilson taught Lily hand signals, and she taught them how to pop wheelies. Lily taught Chester and Wilson how to talk backwards, and they taught her how to double knot her shoes. Oh, they're hanging out. Chester and Wilson are learning new things, and so is Lily. Some days I can't tell those three apart, said Lily's mother. Me either, said Lily's father. Chester and Wilson and Lily, Lily and Wilson and Chester, that's the way it was. For Halloween, they dressed as the three blind mice. For Christmas, Lily gave Chester and Wilson nifty disguises, and they gave her a box of multicolored shoelaces, extra long for double knotting. They loved to go on picnics. When Chester and Wilson told Lily about how they had each swallowed a watermelon seed once, Lily swallowed three of them, and I'll grow a watermelon plant for each of us. In spring, Chester and Wilson and Lily shared the same umbrella. In winter, they never threw snowballs at each other. And in fall, they raked leaves together. And in summer, they reminded each other to wear sunscreen so they wouldn't burn. Chester and Wilson and Lily, Lily and Wilson and Chester. That's the way it was. And then Victor moved in to the neighborhood. <laughs> All right, so Chester and Wilson had their own way to do things. Then they met somebody new, and they uh, got used to them and got to experience some new stuff. Okay? So that's book one. I've got book two here. It's called The Leprechaun in the Basement. I know we had um, 
What do we have? St. Patrick's Day about a week ago. So we're going to catch up on some St. Patty's Day stuff. The leprechaun in the basement. O'Leary was a leprechaun. A long time ago, he had come from Ireland, stowed in a trunk, and now he lived in the basement of a house in Chicago. He led a quiet life. Sometimes he read the newspapers in the recycling bin. Most of the time, he just sat by his pot of gold coins, polishing them. He loved his gold. Still, once in a while, he felt a little bored. He thought that when he lived in Ireland, he used to do something else, but he couldn't remember what. Perhaps I'm just getting old, he would say to himself, for although leprechauns never die, they do get older. If you catch a leprechaun, you get his pot of gold. I know some of you were looking for leprechauns when we were here last. Michael McKeever was the boy who lived in that house, though he didn't know O'Leary was there. It was St. Patrick's Day, and that meant it was almost spring, almost time for baseball season to begin. Michael pulled his last year's baseball shoes from under the bed. He tried them on. His big toes jammed against the ends. The soles had begun to peel away. Michael's heart sank. He couldn't play ball in these shoes, but how could he ask his mom and dad for new ones? You can see down here his toes are poking through. For the McKeevers were down on their luck. Michael's dad had lost his job at the computer company, and Michael's mom said they had to make do. Every day, Mr. McKeever searched for another job. At night, he came home looking sad and plunked himself in front of the TV. He never said, hey, Mike, let's go out and throw a few the way he used to. Uh-oh. Down on his luck, lost his job. We're going to see what happens here. Michael, his mother said, could you get my big pot? It's in the basement by the recycling bin. Sure, Mom. His mother was making her special St. Patrick's Day dinner, corned beef, with potatoes and cabbage. She said it might lift his dad's spirits. Michael trudged down into the basement. As he neared the washing machine, he heard a strange noise. Someone was singing. When the Irish eyes are smiling, sure it's like a morning spring. In the lilt of Irish laughter, you can hear the angels sing. You gotta love singing in an Irish accent, right? Michael peeked around the furnace. There in the recycling bin was a tiny old man. He jumped up and stared at Michael. Michael blinked. The little man looked exactly like the pictures of the wee folk he'd seen in a book about Ireland. Are you a leprechaun, he asked. O'Leary scowled. He had a bit of a temper. Well, I'm not from outer space. My uh, Irish accent and my pirate accent kind of sound the same. Michael pointed to a bowl with something sparkling in it. What's that, he asked. My gold, of course. Michael, I'm waiting, his mother called. Coming, Ma. Michael grabbed his mother's pot. I'll be back, he whispered to the leprechaun. I was afraid of that, muttered O'Leary, because suddenly he knew his life would never be the same. See his pot of gold there? What do you think Michael wants to do? Probably get his pot of gold, huh? At supper, Michael's dad just picked at his corned beef and cabbage. Michael could hardly eat either. He couldn't wait to talk to the leprechaun again, but after the dishes were washed, his father went down to the basement to check on the hot water tank, and there was no chance. In bed, Michael couldn't sleep. A leprechaun with a pot of gold? Why, that gold could buy all sorts of things. The hot water tank wasn't working right. His mom's bike was broken, and he needed baseball shoes. He had to have baseball shoes. A leprechaun in the basement. Maybe their luck was going to change. O'Leary was awake, too. He had always liked to sing an Irish song on St. Patrick's Day, but he could see that he had been very foolish. Now a human being knew where he was, and now there would be trouble. For humans wanted just one thing from leprechauns. They wanted gold. The next day, Michael raced home from school. And the leprechaun was waiting. Listen, said Michael, my dad lost his job, and the hot water tank isn't working, and my mom's bike is broken. And I need baseball shoes. He held out his old shoes. Tis a pity, said O'Leary, but what can I do for you? You could give us some gold, O'Leary sighed. Could you give up playing baseball? Michael shook his head. No way, I love baseball. Ah, you're a smart lad, then. You understand why leprechauns cannot give up their gold. But that doesn't make sense. You have so much. Some things don't make sense, said O'Leary. And ah, still, they are true. 
Leprechauns are supposed to be lucky, Michael protested. I don't know about luck, O'Leary said, his voice rising, but you're not getting one gold coin. You're a selfish leprechaun, Michael said angrily. O'Leary stomped his foot. And you're a greedy human being. They are quite angry at each other. Michael stalked upstairs. His father was coming in the door. Dad, why are we so unlucky? He wasn't supposed to worry his father, but he couldn't help it. He almost felt like crying. His father stared at him. I guess you must think you are unlucky with such a gloomy dad. He put his arm around his son. Listen, when I woke up today, I had the strongest feeling our luck is going to change. It doesn't make sense, but it's true. I know we McKeevers are going to be okay. Now let's go out and throw a few. Like magic, Michael's spirits lifted. He ran to get his ball. That night in bed, Michael thought about the, what the leprechauns had said. He didn't want to be a greedy human being. He could do. Maybe he could tape up the soles and re reached under the bed for his shoes. Then he remembered he had left them in the basement. In the basement, O'Leary paced back and forth. Was he a selfish leprechaun? He stared at the baseball shoes. The stitching was poorly done. The soles were made of the cheapest leather. He looked for the shoemaker's name, but there was only a tag too worn to read. Sure, in Begora, I could have made a better shoe myself, he thought. Why, I was the best cobbler in County Cork. And that was how O'Leary remembered what he used to do in Ireland. He was a shoe cobbler. You made shoes. The next morning, when Michael McKeever stretched in bed, something heavy, he felt something heavy on his legs. He sat up. There on the blanket was the most beautiful pair of baseball shoes he had ever seen. They were green with excellent thick soles and good gripping spikes. And on the toes were tiny gold shamrocks. And of course, they were very lucky. Safe, he slid in at home. Safe. Well, it looks like their luck changed. Changed. The leprechaun became not selfish and helped out Michael. And Michael thought that instead of gold, I just maybe needed some shoes. So we hope you enjoyed our reading today. Remember, this afternoon we are reading at 2.30, not 1.30. And we'll be finishing, uh, not finishing, but catching up on Peter and the Star Catchers. All right. So we hope you have a great day. Thanks and go Bears.